Welcome back to Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today, we'll talk about another part of turbulence modeling, that is the particular algebraic models. These are the first types of closures which we'll discuss in this class for the RANS equation, that is Reynolds Average Navier Stokes equations. In the previous class, we introduced and defined the closure problem, that is, finding and closing the number of equations given that there's more unknowns when we Reynolds average or decompose the sets of equations. And of course, we showed that when we take moments of those equations that we are not able to recover uh, even a number of equations to meet the number of unknowns because the number of unknowns continues to increase with higher and higher orders of correlations. Next, we discussed averaging. We talked about different types of averaging techniques and, of course, their implications of um, identities. Then we talked about the Reynolds average number of Stokes equations, their formation through the decomposition and simplification, and the introduction of the extra term of the Reynolds stress term. And then we looked at the Reynolds stress equation, which, of course, can be used to try and model the additional terms with appearing in the equations. Then we returned and talked more about the scales of turbulence and introduced the all-important concept, the two-point correlations, the Teller microscale, and, of course, how we can derive time and length scales from these correlations. Now that we have our equation in motion, the Rand's equations, let's try and form those extra terms and equations through physical arguments and mathematics to find a closed set of equations which we can then solve. This is what we'll do today. We're talking about the all-important algebraic models. We'll talk about the very important mixing length hypothesis of Prandtl. We'll look at the formation of a particular model through the boundary layer flow or, in the particular case, of the equations for boundary layers. And we'll look at Two of the most famous and currently used turbulence models for boundary layers is the Sebecki-Smith model and the Baldwin-Lomax model. We'll apply and look at these through results for the boundary layers and separated flows. Finally, we'll look at a range of applications for these particular models. First, we need to introduce the idea of the Buzanesk eddy viscosity approximation. This approximation by Buzanesk computes the Reynolds stress as a product of the eddy viscosity and mean strain rate tensor. It's an approximation, and it's used widely in turbulence modeling. We'll show this in a mathematical form, but it's the basis of an algebraic model. Now, we'll also introduce the concept of an eddy viscosity or mixing length. An eddy viscosity is, of course, a modification of the viscosity, which is much larger, to model the effect of turbulence. So the eddy viscosity sometimes replaces the viscosity, but it also could be added to the traditional viscosity to alter the flow. That is, the turbulence will effectively, in the particular model that uses added viscosity, effectively increase the viscosity, which would model this larger scales and strange structures of the turbulence, almost like it's a characteristic of the flow. And that's fine, because turbulence can be thought of as a characteristic of the flow. We also might model or look at in our models the so-called mixing length. And that might be the length at which something mixes on some length scale. That might be something approximately like the integral scale of turbulence. Now, we'll typically calculate the eddy viscosity in terms of a mixing length scale. And this is a so-called algebraic relation, that the eddy viscosity will somehow be related directly in an algebraic equation, not a differential equation, with an algebraic relation. As you might guess, you have already seen that these algebraic models are called algebraic because they're closing the Rand's equations without additional differential equations. Some people might call them zero equation models for this reason. Now, if we use an eddy viscosity or a mixing length, we would call these models incomplete models. An incomplete model is one which uses information about the flow that we would normally derive or find through the solution beforehand. For example, if we specify a point in the flow, which is a distance from the wall, that might be viewed as something we would know about the solution or about its setup beforehand. A complete turbulence model will only calculate the flow field and associated turbulence with only a particular set of equations in motion and not be dependent on extra parameters or specifications, like a so-called mixing length. This is why there's no such thing as a truly closed algebraic model, that they need some sort of specification. We will look at incomplete turbulence models later in this class. 
Now, these types of models have been designed and are especially useful for boundary layers and free shear layers. That's because we can find some length scale which grows or changes almost in a linear rate with the particular distance from, say, where the shear layer starts. Now, let's look at the very important mixing length hypothesis. This one was proposed by Ludwig Prantl in 1925. You'll notice that this is over a decade later from the time that he proposed the boundary layer theory. A very active researcher with a large research program. Anyway, the mixing length hypothesis states that the idea that there's clumps of fluid, and these might be the large turbulent structures, and they move together and they be dissipate through some distance L sub mix. That's the mixing length, sub mix L right here. And here we define, of course, L mix as the mixing length. So there's some packet of fluid and it's moving along at some convection velocity U, the average velocity is a good approximation, capital U. And through that process, it's gonna absolutely dissipate. That's almost like a time scale. It has a sort of a time scale of mixing too. Now, based on this physical argument, we might write and look back at and try and modify our stress terms. So recall, we have rho of tau x y. Look back in your previous presentation of how this term appears in the Reynolds averaging process and, of course, in the original equations of motion. And we can say it will go as, this is the model, so we are strictly writing the right-hand side based on our physical arguments. The right-hand side will be one half of the density of the fluid times the velocity of the mixing, that's the velocity scale of the mixing, times some length scale of the mixing, times the shear of the fluid. And you'll see that this equation, of course, is dimensionally correct. These terms were selected by people like Prantl and his contemporaries to, of course, try and find terms which scale correctly towards experiment or dimensionally correct and have the correct scaling analysis. Now we solve for tall xy simply by dividing, of course, by rho from both sides, and we get tall of xy, that shear stress, will be one half of the velocity of the mixing times the length scale of the mixing times the shear now remember, u is the average velocity, which is a term in that Rand's equations directly that we're trying to solve for. dy, of course, is like a shear term. So this is a shear term itself. So we've created a new equation based on these arguments, which is probably good for boundary layer flow. So what we haven't done here, and it's a missing parameter, is what would the velocity of the mixing be? Prantl, in his mixing length model, proposed this form. He said the velocity of the mixing will go as some constant, which you can calibrate against experimental data sets, times the length scale of the mixing, times the magnitude of, of course, the shear, velocity shear term. This is also dimensionally correct, and as you might imagine, it's useful to take this and substitute it back in the equation for ta xy here at the upper right to try and simplify it. Now, Upon substitution of these terms, which I just mentioned, and using a particular dimensional arguments, we can find that we have a new model for, say, tau xy, where these, where these L mixed terms and V mixed terms will go away, and you'll find that we can write tau xy as some new eddy viscosity, new sub t, so a new sub t we'll call eddy viscosity times the shear. And new sub t, of course, is defined through the substitution. It'll be the mixing length squared, which is something we may know in advance by specification, times the mean share. So we've introduced a new additional viscosity through this idea that modifies the flow. It effectively increases the viscosity in the flow. Now, we've replaced the eddy viscosity with a mixing length approximation. This, of course, is a model, and it's our choice, and it introduces a new equation. We would need to try and approximate that mixing length somehow for each particular flow. And we could do that in many different ways. We might say, oh, for a boundary layer flow, it would be the distance from the wall to any point in the flow. The shortest distance from any point in the flow to the wall. That can be done easily before the calculation starts with the computer, like in CFT. In a shear layer, perhaps, we would have to approximate as a shear layer thickness. Now, thankfully, the shear layer thickness grows almost linearly with 
distance from its origin. So we could cre simply create a linear model for the shear layer thickness with distance. Here's, with a constant, of course, for calibration. These are two simple ways to approximate it. And you'll see these specifications being required in some of the turbulence models that you might use in class. For example, in the one equation models of Spallart and Almaris, originally there was a distance to the wall requirement. Now, we need to still replace tau xy and relate it to our Reynolds stress, because of course, remember, Reynolds stress was an unclosed parameter. We can replace that shear stress by its definition, and we'll find this relation, right? So we can look back at our original equation here, L squared magnitude du dy, and here we have L squared dy with du dy. Why do we do this, of course? So that it's dimensionally correct and through substitution. Now we have a new equation based on our modeling choice and chosen parameters. The negative of the Reynolds stress, U prime V prime, this is basically a 1.2 variable correlation, goes as the mixing length squared times the magnitude of dui times du dy. So, so far we've assumed that the Boussinesse approximation will hold and that the turbulence is unaltered by the mean shear. But remember, we're also solving for the mean share and the flow. So as the flow progresses, the mean share will remain the same with respect to time. This entire formulation, as you can see, is an entirely empirical, and it will only likely work for certain flows. Just because the model itself is empirical doesn't mean it's not useful. In fact, these types of models are still used today, and this is the most basic turbulence model enclosure that you can form for a um, boundular type flow. So you'll observe a few things through this modeling procedure. The first is, of course, that free shear flows, the mixing length will be constant across the boundary layer and proportional to the width of the layer. As we move downstream and upstream, the, of course, parameter will increase. and It'll be proportional to the shear layer thickness. For boundary layers, it's proportional simply to the distance of the wall. I've noted these things when we're talking about the formulation of the model. It took a lot of years and physical insight for Prantl to form this model. It wasn't just written down on a piece of paper overnight. Now, let's keep going and try and form the rest of the model. And let's do it for boundary layers. Before we do that, we need to revisit a few basic concepts of boundary layers, which of course I'm showing here on slide seven. First, in a boundary layer, we might look at it as multiple layers. It could naively be viewed as three particular layers. Remember what they are, the viscous sublayer, the log layer, and the defect layer. We've talked about these at length in our first class on turbulence modeling. Here also, we see that the law of the wall, that is the log layer holds, especially for high Reynolds number boundary layers. Mathematically though, there's technically only and might be viewed as two particular layers, unlike the physical decomposition we show in the upper right. It could be viewed that the viscous sublayer and defect layer actually overlap and they make up the log layer. That's shown here in the lower right where we have y the distance to the wall and some eddy viscosity term. A mashing solution could connect both layers and this is part of the brilliance. Even though Prantl and his research group in the early 1900s proposed this type of boundary layers and were seeing these types of distributions, they went further than others and modified their theory against the common perception and gave the idea of the matching solutions of the so-called viscous and defect layer. We might try and match these two solutions mathematically by varying them logarithmically. So the log layer is actually an asymptotic limit of the inner and outer layers. It's a matched asymptotic solution. Asymptotic solutions are a beautiful theory of mathematics, which of course we can do much analysis with. In this case, we've matched asymptotically the changes of the de defect layer and viscous layer as they approach each other. And we might perform, for example, what we call a shooting method to get them to match. That's essentially what's shown in the lower right. What you see also here is there's some particular length scale YM where the two particular layers match. It's an interesting observation. So if we want to apply our turbulence model to a boundary layer flow, we have to reconsider the boundary layer equations. We introduce these in the equations of motion in the fluid dynamics section of the class. Recall now, let's look at a two-dimensional boundary layer, which is turbulent. We take the two-dimensional boundary layer equations, which we previously derived by getting rid of terms which are small, and Reynolds average them. We have 
partial u partial x plus partial v partial y is zero, and of course the Navier-Stokes equations, which is the minimum term in this equation with viscosity. And you see now in the boundary equations, if you go back and look at them, you'll see there's an additional Reynolds stress term. So you see we have an unclosed set of equations, even though it's an incompressible flow. That's very troubling. So we're going to try and use our mixing length hypothesis to close the set of equations. The convection terms will be negligible in this particular form in the equation. Well, now those are the convection terms within the log layer. Therefore, the sum of the viscous and Reynolds stresses must be a constant so that the right-hand side is zero. That's partial partial y of something that's a constant will go to zero. And so we'll write this equation here. We'll take the argument of derivative in the y direction and set it to a particular constant. We'll write nu of partial u partial y minus the Reynolds stress right here, u prime v prime bar, will go as approximately a constant, which is the viscosity times partial u partial y, y at the wall. So essentially we're setting this particular term, which must be a constant, equal to the shear stress of the wall over density. That of course is equal to the friction velocity, which is the definition of how we found it if you recall in our discussion of turbulent boundary layers. So now we've related the friction velocity with the particular viscous shear and Reynolds stress. We're closing our equations. Now the Reynolds stress must be much larger than the viscous stress. The lar Reynolds stress must be much larger than the viscous stress in the log layer. How do we know that? Through dimensional analysis and of course looking at experiments of boundary layers and getting in physical insights in the problem. This is very hard for someone new in the fluid dynamics to understand and only with experience and over time will you understand how these quantities vary in realistic flows. Right now it might appear very abstract, but it wouldn't be any different than for example someone telling you that the temperature outside is say 10 degrees Celsius or maybe 75 degrees Fahrenheit or any other temperature. You have a physical feeling for it. An excellent fluid dynamics researchers have the same physical feeling about the equations of motion and their terms and how they vary in different flows. Now let's use the mixing length model and arguments which we just derived. We might write the mixing length squared times the shear squared goes as, of course, the friction velocity squared. You can see this appear in our previous model development. Now, we'll approximate our mixing length as some particular distance to the wall. So why is the distance to the wall in the turbulent boundary layer? K, or kappa here, is a constant, and L mix is that. So we can take this form and re-substitute it back in our equations. After the substitution, we can go back and integrate our equation. This is what happens, and we find a particular friction velocity model. Why is it called a friction velocity model? Because the length from the distance to the wall is related, of course, to a friction velocity. Here, here, and here, and here. So you see we're forming these equations and start to back substitute to try and close the model and simplify it. We'll find an equation after integration of u plus goes as one over kappa of the natural log of y plus, which is the non-dimensional wall distance plus a constant c. Now earlier, we looked at the law of the wall formula and the log layer formula. We chose a constant kappa and this form of the model so that when we re-substitute and back integrate, we actually recover an equation which will be inherently part of the boundary layer turbulence model that will force the solution to take the form of a log layer in the wall in the law of the wall reason, region. So remember, u plus is also a non-dimensional velocity normalized by friction velocity. I forgot to mention that. Anyway, you'll see, and if you remember our turbulent boundary layer discussion, that kappa is actually the von Karman constant, which is 0.41, so we'll set that directly, and c is approximately 0.5. So these two constants in the model, which are coming out of the integration for c and kappa from our choice of scaling to the distance to the wall, actually conform strictly and exactly as what we found from measurement and our early, earlier composite profiles. That is an amazing choice, which was made on purpose by Professor Ludwig Prannell and his students. It's actually a stroke of genius. Now, we might use this model, but we do not find necessarily good agreement with measurements. So the model's elegant because of course it recovers exactly what we might want, but it doesn't agree with measurements. If the model doesn't predict and agree with measurements and experiments, it's wrong. So we need to modify it. 
Of course, Prantil and his students did not have access to CFD and computers, so it was very hard to, for them to numerically integrate these models. They could not really validate this model for turbulence over a wide range of experiments. They only saw that it's mathematically elegant and made physical sense. But of course, in this case, their tuition was slightly wrong. Thankfully, a little later, a fellow named Van Driest in 1956 modified their mixing length model by a damping function. So he took the lengthening mixing length model here at the bottom of eight, and modify it with, of course, this exponentially exponential function. So here write L max equals the same constant 0.1 times the distance to the wall times 1 minus e to the negative y plus divided by a naught plus. Here a naught plus is another constant. He called it 26 through calibration. That's a calibration constant, which he calibrated with, of course, predictions against experiment. Y plus is the non-dimensional distance to the wall. The model was further modified by a fellow named Clauser, who's very famous in turbulence also. His type of model modified, instead of the mixing length, the eddy viscosity. And it modified the eddy viscosity only in the defect layer to match experiments better. And he introduced a new coefficient alpha times the speed of the mean flow outside the boundary layer, or at the edge of the boundary layer, times, of course, a displacement thickness in the boundary layer, which is like a boundary layer thickness, but for displacement. We'll show this equation in a second. Here recall that nu sub t is an eddy viscosity. The knot represents that it's in the defect layer only. So these are just some more recent modifications of Prandtl's mixing length model. Another common modification of Prandtl's model is to limit the peak value of the mixing length. That is, if the length grows away from the boundary layer, we'll just limit it and make it a constant as it hits the maximum value. So if we go away from the boundary layer, say 9% of the boundary layer thing is, we just say, hey, that length scale is going to be a maximum value and limit it. So it might grow linearly or somewhat linearly exponentially mixed model from the wall and be limited. There's other many modifications, and we'll look at all these put together in a few minutes. Bear with me. Another major modification, of course, was pr produced by Corson, Stanley Corson, and Kistler in 1954. And this was used to find and model the effect of intermittency. We haven't defined or talked about intermittency much before, but let's just mention it briefly now. Intermittency is a major and important part of turbulence. Typically, if you look at a turbulent velocity fluctuation with time, it's rather well behaved. But once in a great while, in intermittent times, there's large fluctuations of positive or negative field variables. So we might have a very well behaved statistically stationary flow and then boom, something happens in the flow that makes it blow up and then it goes back and becomes quiet again. Some people compare intermittency to the so-called rogue waves in the ocean, that the waves all have a relatively uniform average height of say, you know, a few meters, but all of a sudden a five or six meter wave comes along seemingly out of nowhere. It's because of course, the surface waves have a chaotic nature and there's intermittent events happening at unpredictable intermittent times. So this model was further modified for intermittency. I might also notice while we're here that the Kamogorov model from 1941 did not include the effect of intermittency. And approximately 20 years later, Kamogorov and his contemporary Ubukov modified it to include it. That's amazing, just like Prano modified his models so many years later. Now the flow will be transitional in the sense that near the boundary layer, sometimes laminar and sometimes turbulent flow might occur. This is also somewhat seen by some people as intermittency, but it's not. Intermittency can happen in a region of flow which is fully turbulent. But near the edge of the boundary layer, as you might see in movies online, there's regions of the flow which are laminar, and then a turbulent eddies go through it and returns to being laminar. This should also be modified, and to modify this and include these effects, a model here for was proposed, where it modified the eddy viscosity. That is, we're taking the eddy viscosity previously found, say, in these types of equations, and then modifying it by mul multiplying through by f clip. Clip, of course, is the name of the person who invented the function. And here's the empirical function here. This was also shown um, and found through trial and error and careful choice. Technically, all those equations and terms, if you put them all together, and substitute in them and simplify, you'll find a closed form of the Prandtl mixing length model. You'll probably 
not be surprised that other researchers came along and tried to improve on Prantl's hypothesis and models. And they made these models and substitutions with their own research to cry, try and create excellent models. There's two that we're going to look at and summarize and discuss now. The first is by Sebecki Smith and the second is by Baldwin and Lomax. They're both turbulence models and they're both mixing length models because of course they specify mixing length from, for a shear layer or bounded layer and they represent traditional industrial workhorses for CFD and our community. They will be located in many CFD codes for you to try out if you so desire. Now these models all of course have used closure coefficients. You'll notice that through the modeling process we have inter introduced coefficients through our modeling equations or they could be constants of integration. We have to choose these. Some correspond to physical properties like of course the von Karman constant 0.41 or integration properties which conform to log layer like C for 5 in of course in composite profile. Other parameters like AMAP plus which we just introduced or the function F cleb were completely empirical and calibrated in nature as the process of the model form. Nonetheless, every type of turbulence model for rans based models will have some sort of closure coefficients. The closure coefficients are typically calibrated by executing and predicting the model and comparing with experiment and adjusting the coefficients so it matches the experimental result. The coefficients are then held constant for all other predictions. For example, I might calibrate my turbulence model and CFD code against a boundary layer, and I would keep those coefficients constant and never ever change them. And then I would apply that same flow to say a shear layer. If you are changing your closure coefficients for any particular flow, then you are not making a prediction that's scientifically based. The user is simply calibrating their equations and solution just like you would an empirical model. I might as well just take a polynomial and calibrate the coefficients against the actual solution. I've just defeated the whole purpose and ruined my prediction scheme. Furthermore, people who change their closure coefficients and don't tell the community and make predictions and publish them are considered performing unethical behavior in research and it would likely ruin their reputation if someone found out. Now, both these models we're going to look at are two-layer models which follow the two-layer theory of Prantl and his community. And they follow the mathematical theory of match and symptotic solutions. We've outlined this whole approach. Let's first look at the Sebecki-Smith model. The Sebecki-Smith model is extremely simple and the easiest to implement turbulence model there is. So if you have a basic laminar CFD code in two dimensions, it's almost trivial to modify it to have the Sebecki-Smith model implemented in it. This is a simple graduate exercise in many inhomogeneous turbulence modeling classes. You'll note that the majority of the computational effort is now focused on finding the velocity thickness. And we can easily estimate some y plus value m, which we defined in a previous graph. Let's just point it out here on the bottom right of 7. Please review that. Remember, that's the distance from the wall to where the matching asymptotic solutions occur. Now, we can establish our outer length scale by calculating a distance to the wall. For separated flows, we may mistakenly calculate a negative velocity thickness. And you'll see the Sebecki-Smith model for this reason may not be best at finding flows where, of course, separation occurs. It's making an assumption that the flow will remain attached and not separate. In total, the Sebecki-Smith model has six closure coefficients. It's really the goal of any elegant turbulence model to reduce the number of closure coefficients because, of course, that means there's simply less empiricism inherent in the model. Now, a laminar flow turbulent boundary layer CFD code will easily be extended in turbulent flows with just in a few extra lines in the computer code, as I so mentioned. Now, let's look at the actual equations of Sebecki Smith when and interpret them according to our analysis. We've gone through and found Prannell's model with its famous modifications. Sebecki Smith, of course, modified their ideas. This represents their modification of the model. So they define their eddy viscosity as something like just the eddy viscosity in the inner and outer regions, depending on if y is less than or greater than ym, which we just defined. And they made an empirical model for ym plus. 
Y in plus would just go as alpha over kappa two constants times the Reynolds number, which is dependent on the displacement thickness. Now experiments show that, of course, the Y plus M goes as 0.042 of the Reynolds number of the displacement thickness. Then for the inner and outer layer, they model the eddy viscosity. At the inner layer, they write it goes as the mixing length squared times these two square, the shear terms square root. And they defined a mixing length here. This is the key part of the model. You can see they simply recycled and reused and referenced the form of the model, which we showed right here by Van Driest. Now they also define the eddy viscosity in the outer layer. Instead of the inner layer form here, they did the outer layer form, which is alpha times the velocity of the um, undisturbed flow at the edge of the boundary layer times the thickness. This is actually a slightly different function for the displacement thickness. We'll talk about that in a second. Times f cleb, same function by cleb. Then they found and proposed these closure coefficients. For kappa, they used 0 0.40 instead of 0 0.41. Alpha, they chose this value, 0.0168, and they chose A+. Plus. You'll notice that they modified A+, plus from its original definition of 26. They added in this extra function. So you can see turbulence modeling, in some sense, is a little bit of a creative approach, especially when dealing with, of course, turbulence models which are not closed. These are empirical choices and models to match the measurement data. Of course, they only did this for one case and then exercised the model for many different flows. These are not just chosen arbitrarily either. They contain some amount of physics in them. Now, the last term, of course, is F club term, which takes into account some intermittency effects of the flow. That's the Sebecki Smith model. Now we're going to turn our attention to the Baldwin Lomax model, which tried to build on and improve the ideas of Sebecki Smith and all those who came before them. Baldwin Lomax developed a model for flows with the boundary layer properties such as delta, delta, nu star, and u, e are difficult to determine. You'll notice that typically if we're doing a CFD calculation we may have no idea what the boundary layer thickness is. We may have no idea what the velocity at the edge of the boundary layer is. We would have to know these properties before we run our CFD code. That's rather troubling. So you'll see that these types of problems will often arise in flows where there's separation or shocks. So the previous model of Sebecki Smith cannot really be used for calculation of flows where there's shocks or separation because it requires a priority knowledge of course boundary layer thickness and of course the velocity at the edge of the boundary layer. They're almost specified explicitly through especially this equation on the upper right where there's some Reynolds number uh, dependence on the downstream distance. Like the Sebecki Smith model, it is exactly a two layer model which uses the asymptotic matching approach. Here, instead, it establishes an outer layering scale in terms of the vorticity. So, this is a key difference. They're using vorticity in their model, and it's important and why we discuss vorticity quantities in the beginning of the class. It will handle flows seamlessly that contain separation in boundary layers. It also contains exactly six closure coefficients. Unfortunately, this model will fail when the vorticity above the boundary layer is non-vanishing. So if we're at the wall and we go through the boundary layer, there's certainly a lot of vorticity. And if we exit the boundary layer, it's very likely that, of course, the flow will become nice and laminar again and not contain vorticity. However, many flows in aerospace engineering and other fields contain high levels of turbulence and vorticity outside the boundary layer. You can probably take some time to think about some of these flows yourself. And because of this vorticity formulation of some specification of it of the outer length scale in terms of vorticity, you would expect the Baldwin Lomax models to fail and not give you predictive results. They could diverge or just converge and give you a unphysical result that they wouldn't occur in these situations. Let's review the mathematics of the baldwin lomax model. This is the form and equations which would be programmed in the code to close the boundary layer equations, which we showed previously. Once again, like the previous model, we have an eddy viscosity, and we'll define its definition in an inner region less than ym and an outer region greater than ym. Now we define once again ym as going as the same way as Sebecki Smith, 0 0.042 Reynolds number with, of course, delta sub star displacement thickness. And the inner layer is shown on the left and the outer layer is shown on the right. At the inner layer we go and now you'll see that the eddy viscosity goes as the mixing length squared times the magnitude of vorticity. This is the first key difference relative to Sebecki-Smith. You see now they're using vorticity in the particular model. 
then we also may not know vorticity in advance that something has to be calculated. But you can see it's closed because, of course, we're solving for mean velocity. So it's really a mean vorticity. We also have the same inner length scale mixing. In the outer layer, it becomes very complicated. And you can see now they're even using uh, the types of functions which are only found typically in computers, like minimum functions. For example, now their outer viscosity is this complicated function of alpha, a constant, f wake, the function of Kleb. And then they say f wake is some minimum of the distance to the wall times f max, or c y max u squared over f max. And here they define f max, which is simply the maximum length scale base times the vorticity in the outer part of the domain. This is a very complicated uh, to write down, but you can imagine the computer is very simple. This, of course, in a Fortran or C programming languages, which is what most CFD codes are written in, you can easily take minimum functions, maximum functions, and of course if statements if you desire to try and form this algorithm. So it's written as an algorithm instead of a simple closed form equation, and it's more efficient to write turbulence models as these particular equations or algorithms. Now, there's particular closure coefficients, which I already mentioned. Von Karman constant, they use 0 0.4 still, alpha, A naught plus, C sub CP, C sub Kleb 0 0.3, and CWK, those set as unity. These were, of course, either taken from physical insight, like kappa, or they were taken through calibration through various experimental flows. And of course, it works for a wide range of excellent flows over a range of Mach numbers. You'll see in this particular model that u diff is the maximum value of u for the boundary layer and for the free shear flows is the difference between the maximum velocity and layer and within the free stream. Here they define, of course, this function u diff. So we've worked hard to explain the basis of the mixing layer models or the so-called algebraic models, which are most famous. Note that there's other types of algebraic models. Let's now look at particular results of these two turbulence models. We won't look at the model of Pranel because it's not used very much today. We'll look at the results of Sebeki, Smith, and Baldwin-Lomax against experiment using contemporary CFD codes. So remember, our model formulations did not use a pressure gradient, but they are certainly present in boundary layers. So let's first see how the CS and BL models apply to a series of boundary layer flows. Here's one particular figure. And it's a comparison of the computed and measured boundary layer velocity profiles and shape factors for flows with non-zero pressure gradients. Let's look in particular at the velocities. The x-axis are the distance from the wall in inches for the particular experiment. The y-axis is normalized mean velocity, normalized about, it's of course, velocity at the edge of the boundary layer. The dots are experiments and the lines are present method. Now the shape factor is really dependent, that is h, on the pressure gradient. So even though we did not include pressure gradient in our turbulence model explicitly, it does remain in the equations in motion. And so we're able to vary the boundary conditions at the inlet and outlet of the domain of the CFD to enforce pressure gradients in the flow. This can also be done by adding in a source model in the momentum equation to create an artificial pressure gradient. This second approach is what's done mostly in computational fluid dynamics. So here we can see experiments as dots, and the lines, of course, are our predictions. They match excellently, and this, of course, is for the Sebeki-Smith model. These are very good predictions using the simple closure. Let's look at a little bit more complicated case. So the CS and BL models are applied to compressible turbulent boundary layers with adverse and favorable pressure gradients. So let's apply this incompressible formulation to experiments where there's compressibility. You'll see even then, at least for weak compressibility, the results will be 10% of the max of the measurement, which is an amazing agreement. If CFD is being performed for a case where you have never examined before and you have results within 10%, you've done an amazing job in today's context to CFD. Now this table on the lower left summarizes the results of these particular models. We have different pressure gradients, which are favorable, mild, moderate, and strong. Remember, that's the related to the derivatives of partial p bar, partial x. The flows are labeled here. And of course, now we have summarized the percent error relative to the experiment for all these flows of Sebeki, Smith, and Baldwin, Lomax. Here's the figure of the actual data where these percent errors were calculated. We've computed and measured skin friction for boundary layers subjected to pressure gradients. The top rows will be favorable pressure gradient. The next row will be mild. This one, the 
third row will be moderate adverse and the bottom row will be strong adverse. Now strong adverse or adverse pressure gradients are ones where, of course, the pressure gradient or the pressure is increasing as you move downstream. A favorable pressure gradient means that the pressure is decreasing as we go downstream. Typically flows are attached in favorable sep pressure gradients and detached or detached in adverse pressure gradient. So you can see, let, we can look at the results here. The Sebeke-Smith model is a dashed line and the Baldwin-Lomax model is a solid line. And you can see their agreement. Take a few minutes to look through the results. You'll see how adverse pressure gradients change, of course, the skin friction on the wall. The boundary layer, of course, goes from in distance, increasing distance. Skin friction is just plotted on the wall as you move downstream. That's how they did the measurements and, of course, calculated the skin friction with the properties of the safety at the wall. So you might be asking yourself, which one's better? Well, they're both good for what they're designed for. You have to use the right tool for the right job, just like you would use the right turbulence model for the right flow. Let's now look at these particular problems with separated flows. And remember, Specky Smith was not necessarily designed for it. So we have only looked at these predictions for flows where the boundary layers are attached. Now we're gonna only look at flows where the boundary flows are separating. It might occur a separation, for example, stalling airfoil or examples of flows where maybe a diffuser, which is particularly poorly designed. There's many flows that are separating, and we want to apply these models to separating boundary layers, not just attached ones. So we'll first look at the baldwin lomax model of separated boundary layer flow and examine the so-called skin friction and coefficients. Here's two graphs of the predictions of the baldwin lomax model as a line, and the dots are the corresponding experiments. X over D, of course, is that plate distance. The y -axis axis is the skin friction times 10 to the third, and the right value is the pressure coefficient. You can see, let's look at pressure coefficient first, that, well, the flow is attached and we have good agreement, and then around x over d0, there's some flow separation. The same thing happens in skin friction. So even though the baldwin lomax model was explicitly designed, with the vorticity formulation with the length scale to handle separation, is not correctly predicting against experiment in either cases. I would not necessarily say that these predictions are bad. I would say that they capture the physical trend of the flow, but I would not say that they're accurate in a predictive measure of this particular flow phenomena of the most basic separation on a turbulent boundary layer. Nonetheless, baldwin lomax models and sebeke smith models are still used today especially in system engineering groups where very fast turbulence models and their predictive nature must be used let's make a few more observations first of all we know in these cases the pressure derived from our solution the static pressure at the points is over predictive by the model by 20 percent the algebraic models will always be unaware of fl past flow history due to their formulation. That means they're unaware of what is happening upstream. They're technically one-point closures, and they use a little bit of an empiricism. That is, they have to have specification about the flow before the CFD solvers run. That's why they're a non-closed model. Now, the turbulence is adjusted to changes in the flow on a time scale unrelated to the mean shear. Look at our derivation from, of course, the shear stresses with the scales that we used. The scales which we used in our empirical model formulation are a different order than the time and temporal scales of turbulence and its changes. This is a major problem philosophically, physically, and scientifically of these types of models and has always remained a major criticism through today, and now it's universally accepted. There are many arguments in the community worrying about this particular point. We also used, of course, the Buzanesque approximation, which is generally very good. And along all equilibrium approximations of algebraic models, they cannot be expected to find accurate calculations of separated flows for these reasons. Now, various researchers over the last few decades have proposed improvements, but these amount to, in the end, specific empirical corrections. For example, they may take the base model of Sebeke Smith or Baldwin Lomax and take a particular function like f cleb or perhaps some eddy viscosity type terms and change them. They might add more coefficients, powers, exponential relations, hyperbolic tangents, and it's an empirical exercise. In fact, you as a student, if you are so inclined, can take one of their models, make empirical collection, corrections, and show predictions against a wide range of experiments. And if it improves upon their models, it'd be a, publish, a publishable paper and model. And of course, they would, if it's very successful and well adapted, name the model after you.
So calculations outside this narrow range of fluid dynamic parameters result in horrible predictions. For example, what if I use this model to say predict a turbulent wake? It would be hopeless and my predictions would deviate by large amounts from the actual flow. So in this case, we have a turbulence model which is formed very, very specifically for a very specific flow, but one is almost universally found in all flows we study, the turbulent boundary layer. So you can see it's required and it gives us early physical insight into how the models are formed. And these models are still used today. So they're still useful and they're very fast. Those are their, of course, advantages, but we cannot ever apply them outside their range of calibration. That is, they really have a narrow range of use. Now, some of these following models which try to build on their predecessors could be for example, the Johnson-King model. In the Johnson-King model, they recognized the need to handle separated boundary layers, which Baldwin-Lomax even tried to account for, didn't. How did they do that? Well, they made additional modifications through more empirical terms within the modeling equation themselves and tried to drive the solution to the correct result. Their comparisons are shown in the figures below. Once again, on the left, we have skin friction with distance on the wall and pressure coefficient with distance on the wall. Zero is approximately where the separation occurs. Now you can see the solid line is the new Johnson-King model and the dashed line is the traditional baldwin Lomax model. And the dots are experiments by an experimentalist named Driver. You can see the differences between the Johnson-King model, which is a solid line, and the dashed line, which is baldwin Lomax. So in this case, the famous model of Johnson-King has gone in and made more modifications and coefficient calibrations for the six closure coefficients to, of course, find a better result for this particular experimental case. Now, you could take Johnson's model and apply it to different types of boundary layers with different types of separations, and it might very well behave rather well, as long as you're not too outside the range of his validity and assumptions. If you don't bring any assumptions to the formulation, it should work fine. Well, it's very hard to know what assumptions are broken when you don't know exactly what the flow is going to do in the future. Remember, the range of application for these models. It is critical if you apply them. Do not ever apply a turbulence model unless you understand the assumptions and applications it's designed for. These turbulence models are the simplest and easiest to implement of all turbulence models. But remember, they're incomplete in that we had to specify something about the flow before, of course, we found its solution. And these work well for specific flows like the turbulent boundary layers, where they are finely tuned. As an example, we might examine four particular shear layers. You'll note for each shear layer, that is flows where there's a shear between them, that four different mixing lengths constants are required. So we would actually have to be changing the mixing lengths constants before we run the CFD code. These could hopefully be dependent on something known about the boundary conditions, but this is not always necessary. But these would always be required when exercising these algebraic models with a shear layer, which is a common thing found in so many flows, like a jet or a wake. The great thing about these models, of course, is that there's excellent and fast predictions, which agree excellent experiment for incompressible turbulent boundary layers and shear layers, if, of course, we get the calibration set up correctly. Next time, we will look at one equation and two equation models. That is an introduction to them. They're much more complicated. One equation models refer to the fact that they have one additional differential equation. Two equation models mean that they have two additional differential equations relative to the RANS equations. We'll then introduce a new differential equation called the turbulent energy equation. You guessed it. That's going to track turbulent kinetic energy, essentially. We'll look at two famous one equation models, the Baldwin-Barf model and the spaller almaris model, which is one of the most popular turbulence models in the world and used in almost all CFD codes. Then we'll look at two equation models, which are more complicated, but perhaps you might view, depending on your opinion, if you're with spaller at school or the Russian school for K omega, these two equation models track turbulent kinetic energy K and specific dissipation or dis dissipation respectively, omega and epsilon. And there's other two equation models. We'll then look at the closure coefficients of these models. These models have the same types of closure coefficients, but in different forms and different coefficients, of course, as the algebraic models. And then we'll look at a number of applications. It's going to be one of the most critical classes 
in the semester. Because of course, when you are running your coats, you'll often choose either, as many people do at the time of the creation of this video, the Spala or Mars model, or some form of K omega or K epsilon. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm your professor, Steve Miller.